First Kings chapter 18, if you would. First Kings chapter 18. Thank you for that, Miss Dana. First Kings chapter 18. We'll all stand, if we would, for the reading of God's Word. As we honor the Word this morning. First Kings chapter 18, verse number 3. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Where it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land, unto the fountains of the water, and at all brooks, and preventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all of the beast. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout, and Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Notice verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face and says, Thou art my Lord Elijah. And he answered him, I am. Go and tell the Lord, be, go and tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom, whether my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when he, when he they said, He is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that he found thee not. And now they say, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and that he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. Is it not told my Lord what I did when I... When Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, be whom, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Father, we are gathered in this place for worship and to gain insight into your holy character, into who you are and what you desire for us. Father, I pray by the reading of these text verses that you will again show yourself unto us and, Father, that we can receive these words in our hearts and our minds. And, Father, that uh, not only just see them and hear them, but, Father, apply them and do them. Lord, what the lessons we're going to learn today could, they, could shake our very lives as we would adhere to the principles of the Word. Father, we need more Word of God. We need more of You than anything else in this whole wide world. Please, Lord, I pray that we would pay attention. We'd fight our flesh to let our minds wander, to sleep, and to do things, Lord, that would be contrary to receiving the Word this morning. Father, thank You again for what You're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So much of what we know, we have had it drilled into us over and over. And while we learn by different methods, some in this room learn by hearing, and you're good at processing information, and you're good at uh, retaining it. And you find it easy to recall facts and dates. Others here are visual learners. You do better if you can see and perhaps get your hand on a project. Each way we learn is an avenue in which we can better understand the spiritual issues of our day. Today we're going to find out about a man who would learn some valuable lessons by one of the mightiest prophets of all time, and his name was Elijah. But before we get to our central truth, there are some things that you and I need to consider. What we're going to learn here today was this man, Obadiah, had offered the Lord some pretty choice excuses and that's what we're going to discover this morning. The man that we're talking about is a man by the name of Obadiah. His story is very unusual to say the least. And for years, this story had been tucked between a famine in 1 Kings chapter 17 and Mount Carmel on 1 Kings chapter 18. And it kind of would seem odd that uh, this story would be placed where it would be, but we're going to find some major applications. And let me show you some things right off the bat. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 1. If you have a pen this morning, I'm going to have you to mark some things in your Bible, if you would. 
First Kings 17, 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilgad, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, by whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, just because we're in chapter 17, and look, just skim down to verse number 3. Let me show you this very quickly. Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that it be that it is before thee. Now skim, if you would, go to 1 Kings 18, verse number 1 again, and let me show you this. And it came to pass after these days that the word of God, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Now, by these verses we understand that God had ordained a severe drought upon the land, and Elijah was the one that would pronounce that drought. And three and a half years later, Elijah would come back on the scene and tell wicked Ahab that rain indeed is coming. Now, get your pen this morning, because I think this is interesting if you would. In 1 Kings 17, verse number 3, notice these words. And the words are this, hide thyself. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, and verse number 2, you'll find the words, Show thyself. So what is very unusual about these two words and two phrases, it is this. Elijah was ordered to go to Cherith to hide himself. Now I want you to look up here and let me just give you something else. Now why would God want him to do this? Because here's what you know and here's what I know. Prior to the Lord telling him to hide himself, guess what he just finished telling wicked Ahab? He told him something like this. There is going to be a severe drought on the land. Now, in case that doesn't ring a bell to you, let me just give you this. If you have the nerve to go and tell the king of the day, the most powerful individual of the land, that you're going to point your finger at his face and says, Thus saith the Lord, there's going to be a drought coming your way. And as a matter of fact, wicked King Ahab, there's nothing you could do about it. Now, everybody watch it, watch this, watch this. Now, If your flesh got involved in this, here's what you would have a tendency to do. Look who I am. I was able to stand in the presence of the king and give him a piece of my mind. I tell you what, I showed that king, I'm going to tell him, and he can't do nothing about it. No, 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 no. Look, look, look. Everybody watch. That's not what God told him to do. Look, he says... After you tell him a drought is coming, I want you to go away and I'm going to send you away for three and a half years. Wait a minute. God, can I just gloat just a little bit? This guy's so wicked and so vile. Can I just gloat? Can I, can I just say something? And Lord says, no, I want you, watch this. I want you to go to Cherith. I want you to go far away. As a matter of fact, Elijah, here's what I'm going to do for you. Not only are you going to get out of the picture, you're going to get out of the scene. I'm going to have a very nasty raven to come and feed you. Lord, okay, if, if, if that's what it's got to be, but can you do another bird beside a raven? I mean, God, don't you understand? These are just vile, nasty birds. God says, you don't worry about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this situation up. You're going to get out of the way for three and a half years, and I'm going to protect you. So that's exactly what he did. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And then three and a half years later, here's what God told him to do. He says, now I want you to show yourself. Now wait, 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 wait. Nobody's getting this but me, and I get this, and we're all brain dead this morning. I get that. Okay, but watch this, watch this, watch this. He says, once I want you to hide, and now I want you to show yourself. Now, on the first venture, he might have been glad to say something, but now he's been out of the picture for three and a half years, and now he says, I want you to go tell Ahab I'm going to fix in a sin rain. Now, why is that important? Because here, Ahab has had a bounty on the head of Elijah. For three and a half years, he's been out of the picture, and he's not even been in the scene, and he's been he's been by the brook, and he's been by this poor lit widow woman that's been sustaining him. Now, all of a sudden, God says, I want you to show yourself. In each case, Elijah would have to think this, God, are you sure you kind of know what you're doing? Because if I go to the king, I know what's going to face me. I've been away for three and a half years. The drought has been so severe. Everybody's been affected. The king's been affected. His animal's been affected. He's got a bounty on my head. And Lord, do you really want me to go show myself to the king? Because I know what's going to happen. Is anybody following this? He says, go 
And show thyself. Okay, you said you, you got all that. Okay, now watch this. We come to verse 18, 1, 1 Kings 18, 1. We learn that after 42 months of no rain, God promised that the rains would come. Now listen to this. Elijah, the prophet of God, had been told to go to Cherith. The ravens would feed him and sustain him. Now, here's what Elijah was learning, and here's what you and I have to learn. Watch this, watch this. Every time you and I obey a promise of the Lord, my friend, blessings come our way. Whether it is a small blessing, like whether it's something like this, just go show yourself. But God, I don't want to. You do it anyway. Because here's what I understand as a pastor. And here's what you understand as laymen and lay women is this. Every time I obey God, I want to tell you God's going to make sure that blessings come my way. He's going to sustain me and He's going to give me exactly what I need if he's called me to do a test. Now, what does that got to do with you? Well, it's got a lot to do with you and I as, as, as born-again believers, and it's this. There, let me skip some stuff. As I was doing some study, and I, I realized this, there's about 13 Ob Obadiahs in the Bible that's listed. As this man is another Obadiah, but we learned quite a bit about him. The first thing we learn early on is that in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 3, notice this. Now, I want you to underscore this because we're going to jump from this into something that we might not have seen if we don't carefully study this passage. And Ahab called Obadiah, look, look at this, it says comma, which was the governor of his house. What does that mean, preacher? I'll, I'll get to there. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Now, two thoughts are here. One was Obadiah was a high government official with godless Ahab. And the other, the Bible says, he feared the Lord greatly. Now, feared the Lord indicates that he was not a Baal worshiper. And the pressure on him to worship idols had to be great. And more than likely, he was threatened by his very life because he would not worship those idols. Skip down to verse number 18, chapter 18, verse number 4. For it says this, For it was so... When Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Jezebel had a hatred for God's prophets and was not bashful about shedding their blood throughout the land. And she missed her biggest catch when Elijah escaped her hands. And others were spared by this man called Obadiah. His name literally means, write this down, servant or worshiper of Jehovah. This man saved the lives of many prophets, and it required courage, cost, and commitment. So this man does have some positive traits in his favor. But here's, where, here's, here, here's when I started studying this, and here's what I want you to get. I wished that the story would have stopped there. I wish that we would have not learned these additional truths that how we're going to apply it to you this morning. I wish because this guy had some noble traits that it would have just stopped right there. What did he do? Watch this. He took care of God's man. He took care of the prophets. And in that day, it was a very, it was a very high exalted office. And these men talked and told the people about the very word of God. King Ahab and Jezebel came on the scene and you know the story and how she would cut off the prophets of God and shed so much of their blood. And this guy had the forethought to hide these prophets and he would feed them and nourish them at his cost. So we learned some very noble thoughts about this guy. I just really wished that we could have stopped this story this morning, made some applications with his life, how you are to take care of God's man, and left it at that. But let me give you something else. When you come across Obadiah, you start to see some things in the background. I want you to notice his employment. He was working with the wrong people, and he was helping doing the wrong things. We learned, the Bible says, they called him a governor of Ahab's house. Ahab and Jezebel were as wicked to the core, and he kept company with them. And no doubt he could not raise his voice when he noticed the corruption and the sorry state of things, and he simply remained silent. He did not want to lose his lofty position and the perks that came with his job. Now watch this. Obadiah, as a Christian, as a man of God, as somebody that did not worship idols, he had no business whatsoever working in this administration. Is anybody watching this? 
I could talk about the administration today, but I, I just won't do that. Uh, anyhow, we understand that here is a man that the Bible gives a, a, a good commendation. He feared the Lord greatly, but one of the things that, that uh, we see that he worked with these two individuals, and can I tell you this, there is no doubt in my mind that this guy witnessed some of very, very vulgar, very obscene, very despicable things as he worked close with Ahab and Jezebel. Are, are, are you following me with this? And not once does the Bible record that he lifted up his voice and said anything about their wickedness. Not once did he go to Ahab with his lofty position and say, Ahab, what are you doing, man? Don't you understand this is against the Word of God? Don't you understand that this is not the way you are to go? Ahab, come on, let's get this thing together. Not once does the Bible record this. He was in the employment of a very wicked, wicked couple. Amen, amen. We see the good. Now we start to see the evil come out because of his employment. You can be certain that Obadiah covered up some wrongs and kept silent. Now listen to this. You cannot be around that much evil and filth and it not have an effect on you. Somebody amen that. Can I tell you this? This guy saw some things that the Bible does not list, but I can tell you it had to be morally, morally irrehensible because this guy saw some things and he did not say anything. Now listen to this. Today, unfortunately, there are a few alarms going off about the perversion all around us. We see more graphic content every day. And lo and behold, it begins to desensitize us to the point to where we believe that it's acceptable behavior. What Ob Obadiah should have done with his high rank and position was to sound alarm, begin to work on the hearts of those that was closest to him and those that he had an effect on. But the low standards that he saw started having an effect on him. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. What we're going to learn next, watch this. What we're about to learn next is Obadiah gives four classic excuses that you and I have a tendency to use ourselves. We give excuses why our servant service to God isn't what it ought to be. As a matter of fact, I'm not so sure that there are people in this room that's not even used all four of these, but certainly you've used some of these. So let's just get into the nuts and bolts of this message. And let me show you some things that, that this guy was saying and doing, and maybe it'll make more sense to you. Go, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 5. Let me show you this very quickly. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 5. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go unto the land, unto the fountains of water, and all the brooks. For adventure we may find grass to save our horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. All right. Everybody look up here. I know you get this. I know you get this. But let me show you this. Ahab told him this. Because the drought is so severe... I want you to go find water for the cattle, the beasts, the, the animals, right? Amen. Come on. All right. So here's what he did. He says, he says, you go your way and I'm going to go my way and we've got to find some, some water. Now, no, I want you to remember, I want you to remember this. Who told him to do that? Ahab. Okay. He, now, what, what, what's, it, it's not a big deal. He says, go into the land. All right. His instructions were relatively simple. You go till you find some water for our animals. Come on. Uh, okay. Preacher, you get, you've already said that. Okay, I want you to get that because this will come back into play here in just a minute. Now, I want you to notice this. He was ready to please his idol worshiping king. Go down to verse number 7 and 8. And as Obadiah was in the way, uh-oh, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him. And he fell on his face and says, Thou art my Lord Elijah. No, excuse me. Art thou my Lord Elijah? And he answered, I am. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Underscore this. Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Hmm. Obadiah did recognize Elijah, but here we see a chance encounter with this thundering prophet of God. Just so happens that Elijah and Obadiah met just by chance, you say. Not hardly. Obadiah knew this prophet, now listen to this, but it did not steady him. A man who only keeps company with the ungodly will hardly appreciate a visit from a prophet of God. Notice verse number 8. And he answered him, I am, go and tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here. 
underscore the words, tell thy Lord. See this. Elijah says to him, you are serving the wrong Lord. Ahab should not be your master, nor your owner. In other words, Elijah nailed him to the point to where his true allegiance was. Is anybody looking at this? Go tell your Lord. You go to the one that you worship. You go to the, to, to the, tell the one who you are working under. And I'm going to tell you something, Mr. Obadiah. You have no business working under this godless man that hates God, that hates the prophets, that hates what God stands for. And what are you talking about? I want you to go tell your Lord. Now, your personal application is this. If you are not serving our Savior, then mark it down. You are serving somebody or someone or something. You see, I'm convinced this morning that we reject serving the Lord, doing what He wants us to do, pouring our heart to Him, giving what we are to give to Him, doing what we are to give to Him. But the fact of the matter is, you don't serve God, but you're going to serve someone else. You're going to serve something else. And the fact is, I just don't understand why God's people just don't get busy serving Christ, giving Him an allegiance, doing all they can for Him, because you serve a God somewhere in your life if it's not Christ. So here, here we get the picture. Obadiah is running and doing these errands and, 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 and doing these errands for King Ahab. Now watch this. He, he comes across and he meets Elijah. Now if you'll read the story of Elijah, the, the, this is a thundering prophet of God. This is a heavyweight of Scripture. This is one of the big shots and the big cheese of the Holy Bible. And he meets him and he says, Are you Elijah? He got so sin-crusted. He got so used to being around the filth. He got so used to being around uh, 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 Ahab that he could not recognize the true man of God because he was used to being around let me ask you this. Who or what are you hanging around with this morning? Allow me to show you four excuses. Number one is this. The first excuse, they all start with the letter A, so write this down. The first excuse was the letter, is the word acquittal. Look on your screen, you'll find that. Is the word acquittal. Notice verse number nine. Look what, look what this guy says. What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? Obadiah's question meant he did not think he was doing anything wrong. He would acquit himself of such a charge. Here is what Ob Obadiah was telling Elijah. I'm too valuable to do the job of telling Ahab where you are. You shouldn't risk my life on such a job like this. Here was an out-of-touch Christian telling this man of God how valuable he was. Is anybody listening to me this morning? He held a high position, and that meant he shouldn't be bothered by trivial tasks. He was simply too important. Beloved, that mindset has been creeping into our churches for too many years. There are some people in our churches that said, Preacher, you can't ask me to go visit. Don't you understand I've got an important position? Don't you understand my time is too important? Don't you understand of who I am? Yeah, I understand who you are, but I understand this, what God has commanded us to do. But don't you understand, Preacher, I'm just way too important for that. My time is way too valuable. And don't you know that's what we got you to do? Somebody ought to say, uh-oh, right there. In case I misread my New Testament, he calls each one of us a minister. You are a minister. You are a minister. You are a minister. And you've got jobs and responsibilities into the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, when you were saved, he placed you into the body of Christ for the particular service and the calling of God for you to fulfill your responsibility. Now, oh, preacher, don't tell me about all that stuff. Don't you know in this in this new age, you've got email and you've got communications, and why don't you just start doing this and this door knocking and this going out and doing my responsibility and this tithing and doing all that? Preacher, I just I'm just too busy for that. I'm too important for that. That mindset, by the way, is seeping into our churches today, and it's keeping us on the sidelines. And by the way, can I tell you this? Isn't it funny that the devil's not on the sidelines? Isn't it funny that the devil's crowd is marching high and high and lofty? Isn't it funny that we today are scared of doing anything for the cause of Christ while evil is just coming in by the bucketfuls and we sit in our comfortable houses and we say something like this, that is just so terrible, preacher. Somebody ought to do something about that. Uh oh come on, come on. Somebody ought to do something about that. Did you realize this? God has placed you at your work, at your home, at your business for a reason. And because you may be the only light 
that your business ceased. You may be the only person there at your work, at your school, in your classroom that knows the Lord Jesus Christ and He's placed you there strategically on purpose. Friend, listen to me. Listen. We believe in because of the... Uh, we had this mindset that maybe all of that work is just beneath us. And preacher, I just, I just don't have a calling to that. By the way, you do have a calling if you're saved. Amen, preacher. Thank you for that. The second excuse Obadiah made was a word accusation. The second excuse he word, word accusation. Look at 1 Kings 18, 12. And this shall come to pass. This is Obadiah speaking. As soon as I'm gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab that thou cannot find thee, he shall slay me, but I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. <laughs> I love this. Oh, but I had been around uh, uh, all of these idols and all of this ungodliness for so long, and he kind of believed that God was that same way. You see, Baal, the idol, was indeed full of deceit. So this man thought God was similar to that and affected his thinking. Obadiah had lived in his sin-soaked culture so long that he developed a warped sense of right and wrong. This proves that this man was closer to Ahab than he was to the Lord. Somebody say amen. Something we have witnessed today, and it's this. Many church programs, services, doctrines, and policies reflect the thinking of the world much more than it reflects the thinking of Jesus Christ. They reveal that the church is close to unholy men and not close to the holy God. We are trying, listen to this, we are trying to reflect our culture in the church instead of Christian, con uh, Christian conduct and character. Watch this, watch this. Why is it, why is it that we rather be entertained than preach the holy counsel of God? Well, preacher, you don't understand it, 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 it just makes me feel better. When you get up there and you just smile at me and read these witty emails, I just feel good all over. Maybe if you want to get smiled at and read witty emails, I may not be the man for you to do that. But here's what we promise you. We're going to preach the Word of God. And can I tell you this? We're going to try to keep the filth and corruption out there as long as we can instead of it seeping through the church doors and coming into here. Friend, listen to me. We are, listen, we, you, you ever heard this whole saying? We are a generation from losing what we have now. Friend, we're not a generation. We're just a few years away. Listen, we've got our young people in this church that, listen, it's not even doctrinally grounded yet. And can I tell you this, when we go and when God takes us home, if it's not the rapture, what in the world is going to happen to our churches today? What's going to happen? Are, are, are we still going to have a, are we still going to be able to preach and to teach the things we teach here? Undoubtedly not. Are we still going to be able to see and sense and, and be able to, uh, uh, deliver the word of God like, like we did in years past? Probably not. Why? It's because we are allowing things in our churches that we never thought was possible. Listen to this. Listen to this. He was accusing God of being unfair to him. He was accusing God, you're not fair. You don't understand. If I go tell Ahab what you want me to do, he's going to take my life. And I, watch this, I can't trust God. The reason why we are where we are today is because we have a host of Christians in this room just can't trust God anymore. Come on, come on. Let me pull you in just a minute, and, I'm, and, I'll, and I'll hurry. You can't trust Him with your worship. No, no, no. You can't, you can't come to three times a service. Can't, can't, can't do that. You can't trust Him with your finances. <laughs> no, no, Lord, I can't do that because I've, I've got too much obligation. You can't trust Him witnesses. No, Lord, because I don't understand. I don't know what they'll tell me back. And you can't trust Him to be con consistent and committed Christian on Mondays through Saturdays. No, Lord, because I work around God godless people. You don't understand what you're asking. Come on. And then we wonder why souls aren't saved. And then we wonder why our churches are weak. And then we wonder why nothing seems to happen in our services. It's because maybe we are more tuned out there than we are in here. Our hearts are more lovely out there than they are in here. You see, when I tell you a message like this, here's what you're saying. You know, preacher, that's good, but I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Just preach it, man. Just give it to us, but I don't care. God help us. God help us. Look at the next excuse he used. Look at verse number 12. He says this, And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab that I cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I thy servant, look at this, here's my favorite part, but I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. This is incredible because he just accused the Lord of being deceitful. And if he truly feared the Lord all of these years, 
he would be much more eager to serve him than he really was. We speak about how good we are and how much we served the Lord in all of those years ago. But now our service to the Lord is minimal at best. And many times we complain if the service goes a little long. Get this, allegiance is not an exemption from service, but an expectation for service. Usually those who boast their accomplishments the loudest are lacking faithful, faithfulness the most. Preacher got ugly, ugly, ugly. I've been around long enough to where you have too, and you've seen this. As long as some people get a pat on the back, they are happy and content. Oh, you're doing so good. You keep it up. Love you, love you, love you, love you. But boy, when those pats aren't there, somebody knows what happens? This is where this guy was. Elijah, don't you understand how important I am? And I've served the God since my youth. Shouldn't that account for something? Well, it would account for something if you were serving Him now. It would account for something if you was really on ball like you said you are. Friend, listen to me. You can tell me how great God is on Facebook, and you can tell me how great you serve Him, but friend, listen, the proof is in your life. The proof is in your character. The proof is what you do, not just what you say. Anybody can tell me how great you are. Anybody can tell me what a godly life you live. But friend, listen, if you're living a life that's pleasing to God, should there not be somewhere along the line something that comes out that would indicate that? Shouldn't there be just something in your life, in your character, that would reflect who Jesus is all about? Oh, preacher, you just don't know. No, I'm telling you. Here's what this guy says. I've served him since my youth. And don't you understand that should account for something? Here's this old thundering prophet, Elijah. Mighty man of God. Big man of God. A tremendous man of God. Can you imagine him telling Elijah that? He was a man that did everything for cause of Christ. He was a man that was as close to Christ as you could possibly be. And now he was pointing at Elijah and saying, I have served the Lord since my youth. Really? Really? Let me ask you this. Oh, it's gotten quiet in here. I should have preached this a long time ago. If your spiritual yesterdays are more important to you than your spiritual tomorrows, you have a problem. I know a lot of people in this room that's living off yesterdays because you have given up anything serving God today. Next one, Brother Chris. Lastly, look at this. His last excuse was the word achievement. Was the word achievement. First Kings eighteen thirteen says, "Was it not told my? Oh, I love this. Was it not told my Lord what? Underscore this. I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, and how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them." Instead of it being an excuse, it ought to have been a reason for serving. If he had been wonderful in the past, this should have made him, listen, it should have made him wonderful in the future. Like today, we boast about how much we have done. People's boasting, besides keeping, besides everything else, we want to let people know how we are doing in everything we've done for God. I've taught Sunday school, I've led to music, I've, I've taught, I pre I've done all these things, preacher, don't you understand? Listen to what he says. Was it not told to you, Elijah? Don't you understand how important I have been through this whole process? No. Are you ready for me to close? Everybody say yes. Yes. Crying out loud, yes. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here was a man that worked in the administration of the most godless administration next to this one. Uh, the most godless administration that the Bible records. And now he's pointing his finger at the prophet of God and telling him all his accomplishments. Now, all, watch this, watch this. <laughs> all Elijah told him to do was one thing. Go and tell Ahab, I am back. Oh, I can't do that. Can't do that because I'm afraid he's going to kill me. Do you remember just several verses ago when Elijah says, go look for water? What did he do? He ran and did exactly what that godless man wanted him to do. Now when a godly man wanted him to do something similar, just go. He offers all these objections. Well, preacher, at the end of that verse, it says that he went, yeah, he went reluctantly. But let me give you this. Over in the next chapter, when Elijah is on Mount Carmel, does anybody know this story? 
And he's fighting all of these prophets of Baal and all of these false deities and all of this godless sin, all of this. You don't ever find Obadiah by his side saying, I'll stand with you and I'll help you, a prophet. Do you need me to prepare the altars? Do you need me to do anything? Do you need me? I want to be by your side. Some Bible historians believe this. After he did this one errand, watch this, after he did this one errand for Elijah, he continued serving into this administration and nothing else is ever said of him again. Which leads me to believe this. He loved his position more than he loved God. He loved the perks more than he loved the Savior. You see, he wasn't willing to get out of that even though in deep in the recesses of his mind he might have seen some things and done some things he knew wasn't right, but it continued right along. Let me ask you this. When you are individually confronted with sin, when you are individually confronted with something that you know is not right, how do you take it? When you know that God has instructed you and you hear something in a service like this that you know that maybe is just not right in your life, are you going to continue to live and do those things? Are you going to give God an opportunity to work and to minister and to help you get past the problem that you are experiencing this morning? You see, here's what I know. We can come to church after church, after meeting, after meeting, after meeting, hear messages like this, hear all the excuses, hear about Obadiah and the things that he did and how the godless administration he worked under. And we can look at him and say, yeah, preacher, but that's him. But let me turn this just for a moment and talk about you. Are you honestly, forthrightly serving the Lord and giving Him your best? Or what do you seem to be holding out on Him? that He could use for His honor and your, His glory. You see, everybody in here has an opportunity to be a chosen vessel before Jesus Christ and say, God, I'm going to give my time, talents, and treasures unto You. And Lord, whatever You want me to do, I'll be willing to do that. Lord, I don't want to be like Obadiah. I don't want to be like this guy that on the outside he looked so promising, but on the inside, things were so rotten. And I cannot believe that the Lord did not impress this message on my heart for a reason. And it may be you. It may be you. We struggle in our lives and we struggle in this society and we struggle with the right and wrong today like never before. It seems like the issues that used to be black or white are now we just say, Preacher, I just, I'm just unsure about this. Even our family and friends have abandoned in the very issues and the very core values that we held years ago. Churches today are no longer preaching the true gospel. They're preaching a social gospel, hoping that nobody gets offended. May I, may I suggest to you today that the Bible is an offensive book because it talks about our sin and nobody wants to talk about that today. May I submit to you this morning, wherever you are and what walk of life you are in, can I tell you this, unless you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, nothing else matters in your life. It doesn't matter what kind of a rank and achievement you make or what you've done in the past. If you do not have that commitment and, uh, and, and, and you have a confessed Jesus Christ is your need of a Lord and Savior, my friend, you are missing the very essence and the reason why you were born. you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning we'll hurry what excuse have you offered the Lord this last week of not fulfilling his plan for your life preacher I can't I won't I shouldn't I can't I don't have time everything is against me right now what excuse are you offering the Lord May I suggest to you this morning, everybody in this church have been blessed by God Himself this last week. God's hand has been upon your life and we have offered Him so many excuses. Well, preacher, I get off late at night. I, I'm too tired. I've got commitments. It's time for some of us in this room to really take into consideration what you're going to do for Jesus for the rest of your days. Are you satisfied with your relationship with Christ right now? Are you going to be like Obadiah, just offer these excuses after excuses, and you will not even be mentioned no more? Maybe you can identify with this man more than most. Maybe you just offer excuses. I, preacher, just can't. I won't. I shouldn't. 
I'm just asking you. Where's your relationship with God at right now? Isn't it time for us to get busy? Isn't it time for the church to start marching on to glory? Isn't it time for us to get bold in our commitment, in our character, and not bend or break or bow before the idols today? Father, I pray, Lord, in this room, if there are those that are struggling with an issue, if there are those, Lord, that seems like it just never gets better, and Lord, maybe we're just more like this man that we care to admit. We've offered all excuses. You've heard them all. And we're just a shell of our former Christianity. We've done our duty, we feel like. We've got the pats on the back. We want to be recognized. Please, Lord, I would pray that you'd break some hard-crusted hearts this morning. Let us come back to the cross where it all began. And let us find the sweetness of Jesus like we used to be. Father, in this room, there are to be people walking to the altar right now. There are to be people coming that their heart had gotten a little bit hard lately. You remember how you used to witness? You remember how you used to smile? You remember how you used to, Christ used to be sweet? You just don't feel that way no more. Would you stand with me all over the room? Would you do God's bidding if He'd so lead you this morning? Would you come?